Yes, thanks for inviting me to share this. We had a good session uh, in the first workshop. Um, responding to a crisis. Uh, now, we are all going through, as we all know, I mean, I don't have to say much about that uh, crisis uh, at this time. Uh, as Lou just mentioned before we started, uh, you know, we've become the most locked down city in the world. Uh, we've had uh, this virus is once in a generation, they say, and so many of us that have had a very comfortable uh, sort of life, most of us, I mean, obviously many of us have from time to time problems, but this has been all of us being uh, struck by a crisis which we have never experienced before uh, compared to many parts of the world where they do have all kinds of trauma and wars, and, uh, you know, uh, natural disasters. But in Australia, we have been pro protected very much from all that. So um, I'm just going to share a few thoughts about responding to a crisis, mainly to do with what's been happening now, but it can be used for any crisis that happens in our life. So what is happening to us uh, as we think about what's going on in our lives at this point in time? Um, we are all experiencing a critical life event, an event which is particularly stressful um, for most of us. And why is that? Because as Nolan Hokushima has defined, stress refers to experiencing events that are perceived as endangering one's physical or psychological well-being. So that's what stress is. If our, there's a threat to our physical or psychological well-being. Now, it is, becomes more stressful when we can't control it. It is unpredictable and it is chronic. The duration is we don't have control either. And all these three aspects, if you think about the COVID crisis that we are in, fits into it. We can't control it. We can't control the virus, as we have been told. You know, uh, constantly we hear from the premier, all you can do is you can go and get your vaccination or do this, do that. You can't control the virus. So it, it is, we can't control it. It is unpredictable. What is going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next month? Who knows? Even those who uh, claim to be specialists, the epidemiologists really do not really know you know, they're all going by what's happened in the past, making decisions and telling us things, but it is unpredictable. And how long is this going to go for? Who knows again? So it is the chronicity of a situation affects how stressful it is. So it, all these things fit into what we are going through just now. So the more uncontrollable the situation is, more unpredictable the situation is, and the longer or chronicity, it becomes more stressful. But we need to realize that each one of us, all of us are different in the way we deal with stress. Every one of us, just like we are different in the way we tolerate or deal with physical pain, we all deal differently. That does not mean that one person is weaker in the faith or weaker emotionally because we deal with stress very differently. Just as I was saying about physical pain, we won't say uh, just because one person can tolerate physical pain, he's got more faith or he's stronger or you know, weaker because of that. I can tolerate a lot of physical pain um, and uh, I don't complain about my pain very much uh, that I go through when I'm going through physical pain. But you know that others, even at the sight of a needle, they uh, begin to have uh, pain in their distress in their body. But does that make me stronger? Does that make the other person weaker? No, that's the way we are. So we all deal with it differently. It is normal for people to experience a wide range of thoughts, feelings, and reaction. So we are talking here about normal people, you and me. It's normal for us to have a wide range of thoughts, feelings, and reactions. And what are some of these? I'm going to list a few of them. We feel stressed or overwhelmed, some of us. 
uh, feel very stressed or overwhelmed when uh, at these times like this. Others have a lot of anxiety or worry or fear. Does it make it unnatural? Does that mean that we are weaker in faith? Does it mean that we are suffering from an illness? No. Anxiety is God-given. All of us have anxiety. It is given to us by God. And uh, worry, fear, I mean, these are normal human emotions. We need to accept that, that these are emotions that we are created with. Racing thoughts. Some of us, when we're going through stressful uh, situations, we begin to have all kinds of thoughts and they can be racing because we're trying to control things that are happening and our thoughts begin to race. Others might become more sad than normal uh, when we're going through stress and become much more tearful easily. A, a slight thing happens and we, we are more tearful than when we normally are. Others might lose interest in usual enjoyable activities. They might have been happy or uh, enjoy uh, you know, spending time with the friends, but now have lost interest in that. Or they might have enjoyed reading a book. Now they can't, they don't enjoy it as much. Others, they have difficulty concentrating. Uh, now they're finding it difficult to concentrate on a book or uh, activities that they have because their thoughts are going on to other different things. Sleep becomes a difficult problem for some. Relaxation. Uh, people find it more difficult to relax. Feeling disconnected from others. You know, I, I, I don't feel like I want to meet people. I don't feel as though I want to socialize. So that disconnection, some people feel. Apprehension about going to public places. Now, this becomes even more because of the fear that has been thrown to us. You know, don't go there, don't hear. You're going to get infected. Don't, uh, uh, we get so much of uh, all this propaganda that is thrown at us and become much more fearful of public spaces. Others become restless or agitated. Now they're in confined spaces, the little things that they can do, they become restless, uh, feeling helpless. Others feel frustrated, irritability, anger, and even aggression. And we hear, you know, there's been a lot more, uh, all kinds of uh, domestic violence will come to that. So uh, people, because they are in, uh, unable to do the things that they normally did, they become more frustrated easily. Others, it might come out as physical symptoms um, when they are, again, emotional distress, such as increased heart rate, some people might find, you know, palpitations, stomach upset others might have, fatigue, feeling of fatigue more than normal or other uncomfortable sensations. Now, in others, it might be because now they are stuck at home, little that they can do, they're feeling a bit down in the dumps. Uh, so how do they uh, uh, cope with that? Uh, people might eat more than normal, trying to, to fill the emptiness that they feel. And then that means weight gain. Others might use drug to try and cope with some of their uh, feelings of sadness or anxiety. Others use alcohol and other addictions. There's more increase of family conflicts that's been reported. I'm sure you've all read or heard about that the, uh, at this time, there have been more family conflicts, domestic violence, and even sexual abuse rates have gone up. That's been reported. Negative physical and psychological impacts on children. Children are uh, uh, not going to school, not socializing. And there's been a lot of talk about the impact on children that's been happening as a result of this. Social isolation can have negative impacts on mental states of elderly, my speciality. You know, the older person we now have in, in Western countries more and more uh, nuclear families. And now many of them, uh, because of the nuclear family situation, elderly people are on their own uh, because their spouses have died and have, they, they can't socialize and have contact with families and others as much. And they can't, uh, uh, that results in negative impacts on the person. Now, these are all normal things happening to normal people that I'm saying. But those who are already struggling with mental health issues, those who are going through already emotional problems, many of these things can be made worse during times like this. Stress-related disorders, things like anxiety disorder, people are already going through anxiety uh, disorders or having help from professionals get much worse 
at times like this. Phobic anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, all can get worse. Depression can be aggravated. People are already suffering from depressive illness. Serious mental disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and dementia can exhibit worse symptoms. Again, let me take the example of dementia. You know, that's my speciality. Here's a lady who's already having disorientation for time and space and place. Uh, now she's on, uh, not getting as much stimulus from other people, people coming in, uh, uh, spending time with her. She knows who they are. Uh, and uh, now she's more on her own, more times. She gets loose track of what day it is, what time it is, who the people are now. They, when she comes in, she can't remember. So things can get worse as a result. Physical illnesses, which have a relationship to stress, like hypertension, what we call psychosomatic disorders, diabetes, asthma, hyperacidity, autoimmune disorders, all these can get worse in times of stress. Behavioral disorders in children can show exaggeration. For example, ADHD. I was reading, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, there's been reported that medication for ADHD, there's been an almost 80% increase in the prescribing of medications for ADHD for children. So all these get worse. Now, so what we're going to spend a bit more time now is how do we respond? How do we have tools to respond to times like this? Not only this current crisis, but other crises that may hit us. How do we respond and how do we help others? Now, what I'm going to look at is uh, three areas you know, with, with the time that we have. One is we look at coping styles and we look at three coping styles that we have. Secondly, we look at coping strategies that we can employ. And we look quickly at 12 coping strategies. And thirdly, we look at resilience. How do we have built resilience and look at three important factors. So first of all, coping styles. Now, uh, the research by psychologists uh, in the secular uh, field, in the secular world, have said that there are mainly three different types of coping styles that we have. Like we are all different. We have different personalities. So have different coping styles when we, have st when we are stressed or put under pressure. How do we cope? We all differ. So, um, but this three styles that I've mentioned about, that has been mentioned in the uh, secular world, by psychologists, it has been looked at by researchers who have been looking at people with faith, for example, Christians or others with faith. And they have similarly uh, talked about three coping styles for people who have faith. And here are the three, okay? It's very similar to the ones that I've mentioned in the secular world, but uh, with a bit of uh, uh, modification when it comes to people who have got a faith. So coping styles, what are they? First is what's called a self-directing coping style. What do we mean by that? Here are people who, who have the style where they take responsibility for everything that happens in life. So he or she might say, look, God, I'm a Christian, yes. God has given me talents. He has gifted me with different gifts. And he expects me when there are problems and troubles and trials with what he has endowed me with that I use those gifts and talents to solve the problems that hit, my, uh, hit me. Taking responsibility for everything that happens in life. Does not wait like some people do for all the time for supernatural intervention or help from others to cope with problems that happen. So that's the self-directing style. Secondly, we have what's called the deferring style. And I'm sure you've come across people like that who, what's the deferring style? Here, there's a passive submission, not doing anything, waiting for others or God to solve. I'm sure you've come across people who will say, oh, well, you know, I, this has happened now. A COVID has come. There's nothing much I can do. It is in God's control. Uh, you know, the virus has come. What can I do? God has to do something about this. Waiting for others or God to solve the problems that hit us. 
Now, it is not just feeling helpless. We all feel helpless as human beings from time to time. That is normal. But it's not just feeling helpless, but actively choosing to be helpless and say, nothing much I can do. And waiting, for, as I said, for God or others to solve the problem. Thirdly, what is called the collaborating style. What is a collaborating style? I need help and will seek it. Seeking help is not a sign of weakness. And seeking help not only helps me, but it also helps others. When I seek help, others can learn from my experience. So those, that's a collaborating style. Now, if I had time, I would be saying, okay, spend a few minutes, all of you, and think about what style do you have? What is your main, we're not talking about only style, main style that you have as a person. As I said, we are all different personalities. When I look at it for myself, I am very much of the self-directing style. I feel, you know, God helps those who help themselves. God has given me talents, gifts. I have to take or do what I can. Yeah, certainly. I know God is sovereign. Um, and, but I'm not all the time, everything that happens in my life, waiting for supernatural intervention uh, to sort it out. Uh, now, that's my, my personal style, my normal style. And I've all, you know, even at work over the years, I've always been in positions of responsibility. People coming to me for, and my job was always to solve people's problems. So that's the way I am. So, but what I've realized over the years, and this is where it is important for us, whether we are self-directing or differing or collaborating, once we realize what we are, then say, what is it that God wants me to be? Maybe I am self-directing, yes, but maybe God wants me to be a bit more collaborating so that it would help my wife, help my family. My wife's often criticism was, you are an island to yourself. You never even share what's going on. You know, uh, I don't know what's going on in your mind. So I've had to learn over the years, okay, even though I can cope uh, without anybody's help, maybe I need to do that for my well-being as well as for the well-being of my wife, my family, for others. So once we realize, then trying to be a bit more collaborative. So the first thing is thinking, what kind of style do I have? And certainly these people have shown that maybe the collaborating style is the best of style when we come to talking about faith and coping with stress. Coping strategies. Now, let me look, let's look at a few, 12 coping strategies. First of all, what I would say is acknowledge. When we are going through difficulties and is first of all, is to acknowledge whatever you're feeling. I told you about all the feelings we can have. Now, uh, acknowledge what we are feeling. We are, it, it, you know, you have, it is okay not to be okay. We are emotional beings. Have you heard of these days where you call, are you okay day? We have in Australia um, to ask others, are you okay? We are emotional beings. God has created us with emotions. He has created us to be uh, anxious. He's created us with anger. He has created us with fear. That's a way that God has created us. It is not weakness to feel that way. So first of all, if you want to get over what we are going through, we need to acknowledge this is what I am feeling. I need help. I need to get over it. But if we don't acknowledge it and we say, oh, I'm a weak Christian if I, if I say that I am feeling anxious or fearful, then we won't acknowledge it. Then we won't get help. We'll never be able to get over the problem. So acknowledge whatever you're feeling. Allow yourself time to notice and express what you are feeling. And we get many examples in the Bible of people who, who uh, uh, understood and uh, expressed what they're feeling. Job expressed what he was feeling. Elijah, when he went through the crisis. David very often expressed what he was feeling through. You can so many psalms of lament that you can read. Jesus grieved at the death of his good friend. He, he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says he sweated so profusely because of his anxiety and fear. Uh, sweated, his sweat was like blood. Paul, you can read again and again all the feelings he went through. 
And so what do we do once we acknowledge it? What do we do with those feelings? Psychologists talk about journaling is a good way, writing it down. You know, what am I going through? Uh, it helps. Uh, talking to others, sharing with others, channeling our emotions into something creative, drawing, painting, music. So the uh, sister there with all the piano, if that's your talent, you know, uh, um, music, it's a way to get things out. Writing. I don't have any of those finer skills. So what do I? What did I do during the start of the COVID? Spent some time in the garden and created a little water garden. So uh, to get my energy, my stress out, my feelings out, home improvements. So acknowledge. Conscious effort to concentrate on what we can still do. Yes, there are things we can't do. We can't go and socialize as we used to. We can't go shopping as we used to, but we can do. There are many things we can do consciously do that. Second, remind. Remind on a daily basis who we are in Christ. Christ lives in us and we are in Christ. There is no safer place to be. You know, when, um, when we, uh, as Christians, when everything is going well, anybody can say, I'm a good Christian. I'm a strong Christian. It is when the rubber hits the road. You know, it's times like this as Christians in Australia, we are showing what our faith is. Uh, uh, you know, what many Christians in persecuted countries go through as Christians. What Christians in uh, places where there is no food or water to drink, what they go through daily. This is a time of test that we can put our faith, remind on a daily basis who we are in Christ. What makes a difference around reading our Bible every day and praying. Thirdly, give thanks. Give thanks to God every day. There are many things to give thanks God. Find things daily that you can thank God for. You know, um, I it says think of three things that you can thank God for. The first thing I get up every morning when I wake up is, thank God I am alive today. You know, many people die in the bed or it's not alive today because of all the things that are happening. Uh, I am alive today. I've got a house, a warm house. I've got food to eat. I've got a family. I've got four children and gra four grandchildren. Even though I can't see them as much as I can, they are there. I, they are there for me. You know, I've got a wife who is here uh, with me. So many things I can thank God for. So in the morning, when you wake up, three things at least that you can thank God for that day. Write a gratitude letter. Psychologists say that that's a good thing to do. Who do we write to? To God. You can write a gratitude letter. To your, uh, to your partner, your spouse, your, your uh, family, your friend. Read Psalm 46 and reflect on the times when God has been a fortress in our life. We can say God has been a fortress, but reflect on the times and that becomes a reality now. Fourthly, relate. God has made us relational human beings. You know, when God created the world, he, uh, after he created the world, he looked at the world he created, and what did he say? It is good. It is perfect. But the only time God said it is not good is after he created Adam. And God, the sovereign Lord, he himself, he said, huh, this is not right, what I have done. It is not good for man to be on his own, and he created Eve. God has made us relational human beings. Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. Martin Seligman, a psychologist, says, other people are the best antidote to the downs of life and the single most reliable up. Other people are the best antidote to the downs of life and the single most reliable up. We need to protect ourselves from being self-focused and self-preserving. Research has shown that we experience more happiness from giving than receiving. And we know that in many Bible verses, Acts 20, 35 says, to give is happier than to receive. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So relate. Number four. Number five, contemplate and modify habits if necessary. 
you know, our hearts and minds are shaped by the information we hear and see around us. And this forms a lens through which we see the world, what we call our world view. The way we, we look at the world, the way we look at other people, the way we look at uh, things that are happening. We all are different in the, the worldviews that we have. And how do we come to this worldview? By our upbringing, by the, our parenting, the way that we have been uh, parented, by our teachers, by our church leaders. All that makes us have a worldview. And we all see the world in different ways. But as Christians, we have a Christian worldview. Yes, certainly, that uh, is put on top of that. The media has a bias to reporting negative experiences and worst case scenarios. We know that. They always want some most dramatic. They want to create uh, a, what they will report that's going to be read by others and listened by others. Limit the amount of media and to reliable uh, sources. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, I used to listen every morning to see what's going to happen. What's the number of cases in Victoria? What is the latest uh, you know, report? What is, what is the latest advice? Now I can't even be bothered. It's the same tribe that comes out, the same you know, uh, uh, things that are mentioned and, uh, you, uh, and just to make you become more anxious uh, and more negative. So uh, yes, listen, but listen carefully and limit the amount of media. This season is an ideal opportunity to be quiet instead of that and read and reflect on God's word and good work, uh, books. God is, uh, God, it, our world has become less hectic and noisy because of what's happened. Let's take use of that opportunity. I have read more books over this past year than I've read for many years before. You know, I've taken that opportunity to get books and read good books and to learn a bit more. Um, now, look out for what God is teaching you and how he is maturing you through this time. Everything that is happening, we know. What is God trying to do? Make us more like Jesus. You know, and everything that's happening, we know we are, we've got a sovereign God. What is he trying to do through all these experiences and crises? is to make us more and more like his son, Jesus. Be still and know that I am God. Number six, perspective. Keep things in perspective. You know, in uncertain situations, it's natural for us to think of the worst case scenarios. That's how the way that our mind works. Always thinking about the worst that can happen. We go out, oh, I'm going to catch COVID. Are you, I have the vaccine. I'm going to have, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, all kinds of side effects. I'm uh, going to have myocarditis. I'm going to have this. It leaves us feeling overwhelmed and helpless and vulnerable. So instead of doing that, some questions to help our thinking. What are the things within my control? Now, I can't control the virus. I can't control the decisions made by politicians, whether they're good or bad. But I, I, unfortunately, I can't. Um, but what are things that I can? I can control uh, they are, uh, you know, what I do at home, I can control about uh, calling people. I can control when I go out wearing a mask. I, there are things that I can do. Am I overestimating the likelihood all the time of the worst case scenario? Is that what always comes to my mind? As I said, the worst case scenario um, and thinking the worst situations. What strategies have helped me cope with challenging situations in the past? We have all have had challenges in the past. What have I learned from those that will serve me well during this time? So whatever happens, we should have learnings that help us for future situations. What is a small, helpful or positive action I can take now? Many things are out of my control, but what can I do to help myself, help my family, help others? If you cannot change your situation, try to change your attitude instead. So attitude change is what I have control over. You know, the attitude I can change, I can't change the situation. And that is what we should be concentrating on in changing our attitude. You know, I talk about a good friend of mine who used to, uh, uh, a good Christian friend, very committed Christian, who was my partner at work. He was a manager, I was the director. And he retired just before me. But just before the COVID hit, he was diagnosed with acute leukemia. And he was told, you have only a few days to live unless you go straight away to the ED. And 
he, the, over the past two years, his life has been a great testimony to me. His attitude, the change. You know, wherever he has an opportunity, he'll be sharing the gospel. Whenever somebody came, doctors, nurses to his ward, he has gone through horrible times of side effects from his, uh, uh, from his medication, from his illness, and he even caught the COVID. But he says, God is in control. If I die tomorrow, so what? He, God is in control. It cha he is the change of attitude. Now, cognitive distancing. What is cognitive distancing? We have all heard of social distancing. It is becoming become part of our vocabulary, normal vocabulary, social distancing. Even children will tell you social distancing. But what is co cognitive distancing? Now, many of us have been in situations where our emotions prevent us from seeing the big picture and responding appropriately. Cognitive distancing, or the other term for it is psychological distancing, is our ability to step back and without an immediate response, survey the environment, survey the circumstances, survey the situation, reflect on the course of action, and instead of being dominated by immediate stimulation, then act after surveying, thinking, reflecting. A good example uh, I can think about is, for example, let's say if you're married and you have an argument with your husband or your wife and it gets heated and you then might in that heated situation do things or say things that you will regret for later on. As you say, you know, and you know words that are said, you can't take it back very often. You have then done the damage. So what is cognitive distancing? When the situation like that happens, reflect, take a step back. Instead of saying whatever comes to your uh, mouth or your mind, take a step back and see, maybe I should think about this before I say something. That is cognitive distancing. So that could be situational or it could be distancing, distancing of events in time. So you know when something is happening, uh, in the, uh, for example, events in the distant future are treated differently to the events in the near future. Okay, so again, taking time to reflect and think before you do things. That is cognitive distancing. Number eight, pray. We all talk about prayer as Christians, but how important and how reality-based is it? Uh, we just talk about prayer because as a Christian, I should talk about prayer. This is again where I say rubber hits the road for us as Christians. When trauma, when stress like this happens, how important is prayer? Does it make much difference in our life? Write down your worries as they come up in the day and then set aside 10 minutes in the evening to pray with about them. Give them over to God. Pray through a psalm that you find helpful. Applying it to your own situation. Many people are praying Psalm 46 or 91 in these days. Pray for your friends, family members, for the government that our, you know, our leaders make the right decision. And for those who work in the healthcare professions, they need lots of prayer, much prayer. Do not be anxious about everything, anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is where, as I said, reality hits, rubber hits the road. Number nine, rhythm. Now, now that some of us, the daily routine is in disarray, it's important to implement structure, rhythm, and discipline. How about you create a daily routine in our life? Because we are spending more time at home. Uh, you know, we are not doing the normal things that we are doing. It's more important that we have a routine. If not, I can be lying in bed now that I've retired uh, without changing my clothes in the morning and just relaxing with my pajamas. No, I make it a point to get up, get changed, sit on my desk, do some reading, do some, uh, you know, whatever, uh, uh, talks. Uh, so have the rhythm, boundaries with colleagues and those in your home and respect others' boundaries too. Make time for pleasurable activities and hobbies. Rest, very important. Be a, a mindful of the amount of screen time, television. People spend so much of time now these days on television or on their computers or on their phones. Uh, it, let us do activities that do not involve looking at devices. Try to get sleep, so important. 
you know, again and again, we are hearing the importance of sleep for our physical health, for our emotional health, and for every area of our life. So not staying up or sleeping in too late. Number 10, be active. Stay active. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Take care of it. And again, in times like this, we tend to neglect our body. Now, exercise and stretching regularly is important. Um, and uh, uh, be more sedentary or holding more stress and tension uh, is bad. You know, it's being sedentary. And, uh, and even our government realizes that. That's why even in our lockdowns, we have been given one of the reasons we can go out is to exercise two hours or three hours now they've given us. Why? Because it is known in the medical world that exercise is important for every area of our health and well-being. As research confirms, this is reduces stress and restores the body. Feed yourself on nutritious food. I don't have to tell you about all this. Refraining from emotional or mindless eating. Exercise and good nutrition boost immunity. Uh, even when we're talking about COVID, uh, this is important to boost our immunity, keeping physically active, eating good food, and that also keeps us mentally strong. Get help. Now, continue taking your regular medication as prescribed. See the professionals that you need to see. As you would have read, many people uh, who have uh, neglected their physical health and emotional health at this time because they found it probably more difficult to get that help. And that means further consequences in the longer term for them. So do not do that. Keep with what you're supposed to do in your physical health and emotional health, seeing the people you need to. Discuss and seek help of family and friends. If your worries, anxieties, and fears are getting uh, more and impacting your life, seek help of pastors, church leaders, counselors, and other health professionals that are there. We are fortunate to have all of them here in this country. Read and study from reliable sources. Not all the you know, people, uh, there are lots of writing out there which are not very helpful. Read and study from reliable sources. Give help. So just like getting help, giving help is also important. In times of hardship, most people are resilient and can draw and build on natural coping strategies that they have. But there are others who do not have those coping skills. And it is for us to ask ourselves, which neighbor or friend needs our help right now? Who can we share our resources with? And Philippians, as you know, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. And helping others helps us in this time. You know, it is one of the coping strategies is not only uh, getting help, but giving help equally helps. Now, who I'm not going to spend time on this because we don't have the time. Who are the risk at risk in, individuals? I will share the slides. You can have a look at it yourselves. Practical ideas to help others and helping others, you know, things that we can do to help others. But then I want to just spend some time going on to the third thing that I mentioned, and that's resilience. How do we build resilience? Uh, resilience is not avoiding difficulties, but facing difficulties and going through problems in life, coming out of them not unchanged or unaffected, but strengthened and empathetic. That's the definition of resilience. So it is not people think, you know, I, oh, going through problems make us less resilient. No. And others think when, when we go through problems, it makes, uh, make, uh, makes us more uh, woody. No, that is not resilience. It is not facing difficulties and going through problems in life, not just that and coming out just the same, but coming out of them not unchanged or unaffected, we will be affected when we go through times like this. We are not going to be the same person after this COVID is over. Once you've had a stress, it's going to change us. But coming out strengthened and becoming more empathetic of others, that is resilience. And what has been found has been 
uh, it's been identified again by psychologists that basic existential questions of life, those who have identified them and found answers for them are better prepared to be more resilient. What are these three areas that I can think of? There are many more. The need to belong, an existential question. Do they, all of us have the need to belong to be part of a community, to be a part of a family, to be part of the church community. Those who have gone, uh, identified that and sought help in that area and found that are better and more resilient people. Secondly, the need to believe, having a faith. It has been found by research now increasingly, at one time people would say our oh, faith is not important, but faith, increasingly has been shown in research and lots of publications over the past uh, 10 to 20 years, which have shown faith may not prevent a person from becoming ill physically or mentally, but it certainly helps in the person's recovery. Person who has faith comes out much better at the end. It might not prevent them, doesn't make us less susceptible to illnesses and worries and anxieties, but it makes us better at the end of it, the recovery. And the third existential, the need to become. The person who has got a good self-image is better or more resilient. So while goals are what we achieve, resilience is what we become. We all have goals in life, but resilience is what we become, is what we do. It molds us and makes us better people. Like a muscle, resilience can be developed. So it's up to us. Like the muscle, we can let it just relax and become weaker, but it's up to us how to become more resilient. For my very weakness makes me strong. Second Corinthians chapter 12, we read Paul saying verse 10. Now, before we close, I just want to talk about this, what is called anticipatory stress. We have been talking about stress and we all go through times of stress. Uh, we are not immune as Christians to going from stress. But what is anticipatory stress? Anticipatory stress, we have all heard of what's called the fight or flight response. God has created all of us, human beings and animal in the animal kingdom, God has given us with what's called the fight or flight response. When we are challenged with a situation, either we fight it or we flee from it. What happens when we have a challenging situation is that our body begins to uh, uh, change physiologically. It secretes a number of chemicals, especially what's called corticosteroids and adrenaline in our body, either to fight or to flee. The best example I usually give is if you have seen a cat and a dog. When a cat faces a dog, what happens to the cat? You'll find that the, uh, the, the back arches, the hair stands on it, the pupils dilated, it is dilated, the paws protrude, and, uh, and the cat is either going to fight the dog or to fly away from the dog. All these reactions are happening. But if you think about it, if you have a cat or if you have observed a cat, when the cat is not facing a dog, it is not lying on a, your couch or on your bed and constantly thinking, what am I going to do if the, when the dog comes? How am I going to react? What am I going to do? Animals don't do that. Human beings are the only beings who are constantly worrying and stressing about things like the nuclear disaster that might happen or the climate change that might happen or my children's education, my children's marriage, my financial situation, what am I going to do when I retire? What's going to happen to me? Constantly worrying and uh, what's called anticipatory stress. And what are we doing? We are throwing adrenaline and corticosteroids into our body all the time. And what is that doing? It is, I mean, when a time of stress, when it's going to, when we have to fight or fly, then it is important that our blood vessels to certain organs are dilated so we get more blood to the muscles and the brain other areas it's constricts like the gastrointestinal system you don't need uh, uh, much 
blood going into the gastrointestinal system or a reproductive system during a time of challenge. Uh, that is not the most important for the body. Um, so the blood vessels dilates there. Uh, uh, we throw corticosteroids so that more sugar is thrown into our body so that we have more energy and all that to fight or to flee. But when we are not having that, if we are constantly, that's what human beings are doing, throwing this, it is damaging every organ from our head, from our brain to our feet by this you know, blood vessels dilating high blood pressure. Glucose being thrown into our body, more diabetes in, in, in our society. And the latest research this year I heard, which is saying that even dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, could be due to this anticipatory stress and throwing a lot of adrenaline and corticosteroids into our system from every system of our body is being affected with this. Consequences of sustained fight or flight response. We damage our emotions and our physical being. You know, in the Bible, we talk about all the commandments and we major on the big commandments like do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal. But the most often stated commandment in the Bible is fear not or do not be afraid. That's the most often stated. And I've read somewhere that has been stated, if you read the Bible, 365 times in different versions, which says fear not or do not be afraid. For One for every day of the year, because God knew that this is the area which we have all the most problem. And Charles Spurgeon has written, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. And we read in Matthew 6, 34, don't worry at all then about tomorrow. Tomorrow can take care of itself. One day's trouble is enough for one day. Well, I'll stop sharing uh, uh, there. And um, uh, can I just mention in closing that, you know, the Center for Theology and Psychology have got, we've got lots of webinars, resources. If you look into the website, even just uh, uh, this week, we had webinars on youth mental health, which is a big problem for, uh, uh, that we are facing now. And so regularly we have all these webinars and different educational. And the other one is Transform for Life. Many of you know Sunny, who is a member of your church. And uh, uh, Transform for Life have a lot of courses as well, which could be of help. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, KG. That was fantastic. And um, I can mention myself, of course, we do know Sunny and his resources. Many of, them have, of us have attended them. I actually did attend, actually, myself and uh, David Chung from our church. We both attended the uh, youth mental health uh, sessions over uh, three days, actually. It was really good. Very good. So fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we now have time for questions. And Justine, you uh, asked a question. Uh, I think with the numbers of us here, I might just ask you if you'd like to just ask your question and uh, KG will answer it. Yes. With your piano as well. We play the piano as well, same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. George. That was excellent. That was really helpful. Um, I it was actually you kind of actually kind of answered it towards the end. It's quite it's quite funny. Um, but it was actually quite early on in your presentation. You were talking about the fact that God naturally gave us these fear responses. Like, like fight or flight, for example, and that's why I was saying you, you dealt with it later on. Um, I was just asking, it's so common among Christians that we should, that, that we say to one another, oh, we shouldn't be anxious, we shouldn't worry because of Matthew 6, right? And um, I guess, how do we reconcile God's command? You know, you were saying 365 times in the Bible, do not fear, don't worry. <laughs> Um, how do we re reconcile God's command to not worry, but also know at the same time that anxiety is a natural response to stressful situations as well? Right. Uh, good question. Now, uh, I would say, uh, le let's look at it from, for us as normal people and those who are suffering from an illness. Okay? We need to make a distinction between the two. 
So first of all, if you, normal people, I said, we all go through these emotions because it's God-given emotions. How do we deal with them? Uh, it, it, rather than if somebody comes and tells you, you know, uh, don't worry, and you've got a week of faith. I mean, this is what we have been doing as Christians, unfortunately, very often, and condemning, putting people under condemnation. So first thing is, I hope this will, all this will help us to realize this is normal. We do feel that. So that's the first thing that I mentioned is acknowledging it. And before we can help ourselves or help others is acknowledge that this is something that I am feeling before then looking what are the strategies that I can use as some of the strategies that I shared today to try and reduce that anxiety or stress. So the first key point is acknowledging. I'll come back to that. Acknowledge that is something that's happening to me. I'm feeling that way. And also when you're helping others, acknowledge that this is that something that they are going through and in, in Transform for Life, if you go through the training program, many of you have gone through, and there's also at the moment, there's a new program that's developed during the time of crisis called Agent of Healing, which is also very helpful, is uh, uh, we are being there not as professional helpers to give uh, solutions to their problem. We are fellow travelers rather than solution providers. So very often uh, for friends, all that they want is somebody to walk with them, you know, to acknowledge what they are going through, understand what they're going through, rather than giving them solutions to their problem. But we as Christians very quick to give solutions and give answers, you know, and very often spiritual answers, being very over spiritual. Uh, but what people want is someone just to walk with them. So that is for normal people. But those who are going through probably a, when it has gone beyond normalcy and they are having an anxiety disorder or a post-traumatic stress disorder or a phobic anxiety disorder, they need professional help. We, that's what we can do. When we begin to realize now this is beyond uh, normal anxiety, this is beyond anything that we can do to help, one of the biggest thing we can do is point them to the help that they need, whether it be counselors in our church, whether it be a psychologist, whether some, some of them probably even need a psychologist. That itself is a great help in our walking with someone is knowing our limitations and knowing when to refer. Well, thanks so much for that, uh, KG. Uh, perhaps we have time for one more question. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a, a, a question of KG, please? Great, thank you for that, Ben. Uh, thanks, KG, for your um, message to us. It was a very, it was fantastic, actually, uh, from your slides as well. Very welcome, thorough. Yeah, most welcome. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting as well, and I'm sure helpful to each one of us. I certainly learned uh, a lot about it, about myself. It sounds to me like uh, your wife and, and you and uh, my wife and I are very similar. <laughs> very the coping agree. styles and personalities. Yes, that's right. We are. <laughs> my wife has been a great help to me uh, with that. So uh, thanks so much for that. Now, just to uh, remind us as well, I'll just uh, share my screen again. Yeah. Uh, just to remind us that we have uh, the workshops, of course, are finished. Sorry. Um, what do we have for the rest of our program, of course, uh, this evening, uh, 7.30, our trivia night. And then tomorrow, of course, uh, Andrew Reid will speak again. I'm uh, sure some of you heard him last night. I give a message on Genesis chapter one, and he's going to continue that tomorrow. Combined service at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Mandarin and English uh, congregations coming together. So that should be fantastic. It will be evangelistic. So great opportunity to invite our family and friends along to celebrate the 156th anniversary of the church. So uh, do come along and do invite your friends uh, even to the trivia uh, tonight. They can be part of your team. Uh, let me close our time now with a, uh, with a word of prayer. Father God, we just uh, thank you for KG. Thank you for his sharing, Lord, his uh, experience, Lord, and his uh, uh, godly experience as well, Lord, in uh, 
and directing us and helping us to understand more, Lord, about what it uh, means, how you made us uh, to be as uh, your people, Lord. And how we can uh, depend and rely upon you, Lord, and uh, be of help, Lord, not only to ourselves, but to most particularly to other people around us as well, Lord. Hmm. Help us to use all that we've learned today, Lord, to, uh, to help others. Uh, thanks, Lord, for KG. Pray that you would uh, continue to bless him, Lord, even uh, with the retirement, Lord, as he uses his time in uh, wonderful ways to help others as well, Lord. So we thank you so much for him, Lord. And we commit this uh, uh, day to you now, Lord, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.